You might have noticed there are some big problems in the world. People are dying under bombs, in the heat, for lack of money, and at the hands of police. We want to fix these things, right? So the question is how? Billions of people's lives and freedom are at stake. So we'd better get it right. For the past few months on this channel, I've been talking about various methods people have employed to liberate themselves. This video is about a few of the more radical strategies for change that I can talk about on YouTube. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel for everyone, everywhere, at their own pace. This video is for educational, entertainment, and whatever other purposes I need to cover my ass. This week's video was brought to you by these popular brands. To know what we're protesting, we need to understand centralized power. I started learning about how power works on 9-11. 9-11 became an excuse for some people to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. The same people also publicly implied they had designs on Syria, Libya, and Iran. The U.S. invaded Afghanistan, then spent the next year and a half talking about the urgent need to invade Iraq to stop Saddam from firing missiles he didn't have. So people hit the streets. Some of the biggest public protests ever. In 2002 and 3, millions marched through the streets of major cities all around the world. And then the U.S. and its allies invaded Iraq. Why did the protests fail in their main objective? Not enough people? Not enough commitment? Not enough signs? I would argue the problem was they didn't do enough to disrupt. No one with the power to stop the war felt threatened. Most of their property remained intact, their bank accounts undiminished, their lives undisturbed. Small groups among the marchers made attempts to cause damage to property, but self-appointed spokespeople of the protest disavowed them, calling them violent, and saying they didn't represent the harmless stroll through the city that would somehow change the world. Today we'll be looking at three categories of methods people use to change things. Peaceful protesting, resistance, and direct action. I'm using my own definitions, interpretations, and conclusions based on what I've learned from the literature. I don't know what's right for you in your situation. But if you're new to any of this, I might have some ideas for you. Peaceful protests are orderly affairs that follow all the rules and don't get in anyone's way. Or if they do, it's only for a minute and then they move on. Police issue permits for protests because you're only allowed to be publicly outraged if you've asked permission. Then they kettle protesters into free speech zones out of the way of anything going on where you can make your voice heard by no one. Governments might even encourage protests for their own purposes, as George Bush did after millions of people marched against him. Democracy's a beautiful thing, he said. People are allowed to express their opinion, and I welcome people's right to say what they believe. They don't view Saddam Hussein as a risk to peace, I respectfully disagree. State spokespeople love saying they welcome peaceful protests but will punish any attempt to break the law. Some protesters believe if I'm not doing anything wrong by my own standards, the police will leave us alone and the press can't say we did anything wrong. But peaceful, law-abiding protesters get arrested and attacked with impunity all over the world. Then they get smeared as violent, criminals, outside agitators, terrorists, extremists, and deserving every punishment they get. Campaigns and movements are rarely violent to start. They become violent when all non-violent roads to change prove to be blocked. JFK said those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. He wanted to make space in the political system to grant the growing anti-racist movement of his time some minor concessions like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in order to appease enough people for long enough to keep the conflict on a manageable level and go back to business as usual. It worked. Things didn't have to get better anymore. It just got harder for openly racist politicians to get elected for a while. If you're protesting, there's probably a serious problem with many people's lives at stake, like war, climate change, and the criminalization of your body. These are not 
peaceful policies. The state either initiates the problem or protects those who do. And yet many people feel the need to commit to an arbitrary definition of nonviolence and swear off all other forms of resistance. But if people's lives are at stake, why should we be all nice and polite and thank you, Mr. Police Officer, even when we see it doesn't work? We should be unleashing our rage until these problems are confined to the annals of history. But even if you don't feel the rage yet, if you want to stop a war or other policy, you are necessarily in conflict with the people who made that decision. Those people have the entire police force to impose their decisions on you, and you have no legal way to hold them accountable for self-serving mass murder. To say everyone has to remain peaceful or their protest is illegitimate is to ignore everyone who will not be saved by nonviolence. To throw them under the bus because nonviolence, whatever that means, is more important than being effective. It's counterproductive and cowardly to hand people over to the police for smashing Starbucks windows and torching cop cars. If you're talking to the press, remind them what the real problem is, and don't let them distract from the issue by getting you to sell out your fellow protesters. Solidarity is the only way we're going to reach our goals. The mistake I think most people are making when they insist on keeping things peaceful is thinking they can affect government policy. I get it. We've always been told our voice counts and if you threaten not to vote for a politician or recall one, they'll listen to you. But I haven't really seen the evidence. Peaceful protesting doesn't influence the state because the state doesn't have to care. It can just beat you up or ignore you and carry out the policy anyway. It doesn't have to do what you want just because you have a voice and a vote and a list of rights. None of that means you have any influence on policy. Unpopular policies are the norm, and politicians who pass them get re-elected. What are you going to do? Recall them all? To get elected, you need lots of money, and to get lots of money in politics, you basically need to let your donors write your policies. The effect of public opinion is to frame policy as necessary and beneficial for voters. We have a duty to invade Iraq. Saddam threatens your life. We have to give a trillion dollars to the people who crashed the economy or else you'll lose your home. Today we're giving more weapons to Israel because it needs to shower crowded cities with bombs to kill the terrorist it suspects of hiding there. So when I see people marching angrily but peacefully, demanding that the government rein in the day-to-day -day horrors of capitalism, I'm always reminded of this line from the movie Sneakers. We are the United States government. We don't do that sort of thing. Any kind of mass public protest has its disadvantages. And there are alternatives, which we'll get to. If your strategy requires lots of people to be in one place, it's not something you can do that often. So you'll want to know it's having a tangible effect. Organizing events on a large scale, not to mention traveling to them from a great distance, demands a lot of energy and resources, which must be drawn from the same pool of energy and resources upon which ongoing and locally based projects depend. If a demonstration results in mass arrests, as the less militant civil disobedience oriented mass action models are wont to, this can consume time, money, and attention that might be more profitably applied to some constructive end. More insidiously, because the mass action model focuses on exceptional events that largely take place in well-known cities, it can foster the unhealthy impression that history is determined at special occasions in Washington, D.C., rather than in the decisions people everywhere make in their daily lives. What's more, traveling great distances to events and risking arrest is not feasible for everyone. Finally, mass action at a major event gives the police a chance to prepare. They record your face and put it in their databases. Then they arrest as many demonstrators as they can. Their success at blocking a protest makes them seem invulnerable. I'm not trying to say there's no place for marches and demonstrations that don't resort to violence. When you march through downtown for Palestine, you're showing solidarity with the victims of empire. What I'm saying is such protests do not change the minds of the decision makers and the resources they require might be better spent elsewhere. 
but some people are too comfortable with the status quo to countenance doing something effective. In mass actions, these people clash with those who want to diversify their tactics. In a politics of protest, with its invariable split between reformists and revolutionaries, the reformists almost always win, because the ruling class sides with them in order to take the steam out of the movement and neutralize it, knowing that they can always renege on the reforms later after all the commotion has died down. By contrast, direct action, which we'll get into in just a bit, and resistance more generally are not about getting the word out to people who aren't listening, but doing something to achieve a goal. Resistance means you're resisting an oppressive force. To know how to resist, we need to understand decentralized power. Resistance does not have to be armed. The campus occupations in support of Palestine are examples of non-violent resistance, while the Vietnam War was won by armed resistance. Resistors choose their strategy and tactics based on their situation. Non-violent resistance leads some resistors to take up arms when the implacable state continues its policies. But pretty much all armed resistance comes following numerous attempts to negotiate that were rebuffed by the state. Effective resistance requires a diversity of tactics, which means what it sounds like. Instead of sticking to the one way of protesting everyone knows about and letting the state tell you what to do and where to go, you try a variety of things and see what works for what time and place. There are many forms of protest that can have an effect without physically hurting anyone but they still need to disrupt the flow of capital or the work of the state or just the comfortable daily life that stops people from seeing the problem. Marches and occupations had a galvanizing effect on the public uprisings in Egypt and Syria because they were bold acts of defiance. Getting a permit to march through downtown for an afternoon is a parade. People worry that diversity of tactics is just mob violence with a cool name. It just means not taking violence off the table. For one thing, your opponent, the state, uses violence to do everything. To say it's unjustified to use violence against an incurably violent enemy is letting the enemy tell you how to fight back. If you really want to hurt me, punch me in my steel armor. Second, to say violence is ineffective is simply incorrect. When you ditch the gene sharp and look at the effects of uprisings and acts of resistance around the world. Again, how did the Vietnamese kick out the French in the US? How did all independence movements remove their imperial masters? How did activists shut down the 1999 WTO conference? How did Kurds in Syria and Zapatistas in Mexico manage to carve out and defend free territories? It wasn't by reasoned argument. Third, if your opponent is going to say you were violent and treat you like you are regardless of what you do, you don't lose anything from the tactical application of force. And if you do it right, you might just get away with it. So how do you disrupt? The possibilities are endless, so here are a few of them just to get you started. Going on strike throws a wrench into the endless accumulation of capital and earns workers a little extra for their trouble. But you don't have to work somewhere to shut down operations. Smashing windows, setting fires, occupying workplaces, blocking doorways, blocking roads. It's a lot harder to get to work with all that going on. Even just a well-organized boycott can hurt a company's bottom line. But rioting and looting can be forms of protest too. I refer you to this book. Also, you can clean up the streets while you're out. Let's go back to 2002. What if instead of being peaceful, more people had taken their anger out on corporations that would profit from the war? They would have been conveying a message the owners of capital might actually hear, a message that threatened more such anger in the future, making it more difficult to do business. Business owners might not value other people's lives, but they do value their own money. Puncturing their pocketbooks with the promise of more to come might have made them reconsider. What if when talking to the press, instead of distancing themselves from those who broke windows, the other protesters had said a few temporarily inconvenient stores were nothing compared to the million people who were going to die due to this invasion and the trillions of dollars that would be spent? What if instead of scolding and policing people who were doing something brave and useful, the other protesters had protected rioters from the police? They would have learned solidarity and tactics in one lesson. Instead, they divided themselves into peaceful protesters who own the moral high ground and those bad, violent guys it's okay to hand over to the police. Do you think it's their fault the police break up protests? 
Do you think the state would let you stop the war if you just kept it peaceful? Do they intervene on the side with the moral high ground? But short of overthrowing the state, no matter what the people opposing the war did, there was always the chance the invasion would have gone ahead regardless. As important as it was to stop that war, the specific demand not to invade could be patronizingly acknowledged and dismissed. The people who order the war are surrounded by law enforcement and security who will protect those people and even their property property with their lives. That's the job of police, to put their bodies between the ruling class and justice. So in order to literally stop people from implementing their policies, you'd need to fight through the entire law enforcement apparatus. What if you don't have access to the hundreds of thousands of people that would presumably require? How do you make demands? The answer is, you don't. For one thing, we don't want to perpetuate the lie that centralized hierarchical institutions are the only ways to get things done, when we could be providing a counterexample. We'll get into that later. But just making demands assumes that the political system might acquiesce to them. That doesn't happen much. If the government is willing to grant your demands, they're clearly inadequate. We shouldn't accept what MLK called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Movements premised on specific demands will collapse as soon as those demands are outpaced by events, while the problems that they set out to address persist. Even from a reformist perspective, it makes more sense to build movements around the issues they address rather than any particular solution. Meaningful change will take a lot more than whatever minor adjustments the authorities might readily grant. The problem might be that we want everything. Freedom for everyone, an end to all forms of oppression, collective ownership of resources. We get told we're being greedy or whatever epithet because we want an end to the system the way it is, an end to the power of the powerful. And of course that's a concession no one would ever grant. Government, corporations, NGOs can never give us freedom. They're not structurally capable of it, the way we're not built to breathe underwater. They will never abolish war and money and prisons. They can never return full control of resources to the people whose land they're on. They won't even supply clean water to everyone after they took ownership of it. Residents have been demanding clean water for Flint, Michigan and native reservations for decades now. Maybe they just didn't ask nicely enough? The fact that charges were pressed against Freddie Gray's killers after the riots in Baltimore suggests that the only way to make any headway is to break off petitioning entirely. It's smarter to appear implacable. So, you want to come to terms? Make us an offer. In the meantime, we'll be here blocking the freeway and setting things on fire. People who have different demands or no demands at all can still build collective power together. If we understand movements as spaces of dialogue, coordination, and action, it's easy to imagine how a single movement might advance a variety of agendas. The more horizontally structured it is, the more capable it should be of accommodating diverse goals. Our challenge is to create spaces where people can discuss and implement solutions directly, on an ongoing and collective basis. A strong enough movement could strike blows against industrial pollution, state surveillance, and institutionalized white supremacy, but only if it didn't limit itself to mere petitioning. Demand-based politics limits the entire scope of change to reforms that can be made within the logic of the existing order, sidelining us and deferring real change forever beyond the horizon. Instead of making demands, let's start setting objectives. The difference is that we set objectives on our own terms, at our own pace, as opportunities arise. They need not be framed within the logic of the ruling powers, and their realization doesn't depend upon the goodwill of the authorities. The essence of reformism is that even when you win something, you don't retain control over it. We should be developing the power to act on our own terms, independent of the institutions we're taking on. This is a long-term project, and an urgent one. Now we're talking about direct action. To reiterate, in case your mind was wandering right now, direct action means doing something ourselves, rather than waiting for the legal authorities to approve of our application to be free temporarily. The Underground Railroad was direct action. Setting up free abortion clinics where abortion is illegal is direct action. Operating a crisis intervention hotline so people don't have to call the police is direct action. Helping migrants cross inhospitable terrain is direct action. Handing out food and harm reduction supplies is too. 
These examples could also be considered mutual aid, which is non-hierarchically organized action to meet each other's needs. But setting up consensus-based unions, neighborhood assemblies, or other organizations is also direct action. Coordinating networks of people to expose and stand up to fascists is direct action. Big up Bristol anti-fascists for last weekend. In direct action, we not only circumvent state restrictions, but forge new relations, relations based on solidarity, demonstrating how much a few committed people can do. The protests against Operation Iraqi Freedom didn't have a lasting effect because they didn't transform social relations or spread radical ideas. People simply came together to petition the ruling class to change their minds, and when their methods were proven ineffectual, they abandoned their efforts. They had so much potential. As the protests occur, as mutual aid networks are formed, as people join together with their co-workers to build a vibrant spiritual community or build affinity, a space of its own is created. These new formations are created by a situation, a crisis that pressed people to respond, but they have their own social relationships as well. Inside of a protest space, even the most outwardly disruptive, there is a social fabric, a way of relating between people. The dialectic of this current crisis is that it continues to build this space night after night in situation after situation because people are being crushed. Our day-to-day -day life is slowly creeping away from us. Our old lives seem as distant as a stable job or an unburdened mind. And the new walls are being erected as we try to find solutions. The old world is quite literally dying, and the ways in which we get by as its rotting corpse stinks and seeps is not just how we deal with the death, it's quite literally the new world struggling to be born. Mutual aid is the antidote to fear, despair, and isolation, says Scott Crow. What it does is it makes you not think about the fear of the future. If we work together to build these networks of autonomy and collective ideas, they have liberatory foundations, says Crow. The way we survive now is not just a pathway to something else or the promise that we will be delivered to a new world after the catastrophe. Instead, we're actually building the new world in the moments we create. This is because there is no great revolution to wait for, only us and what we decide to do. I don't want revolution on the other side. I don't want capital R revolution. I want it now, man. What I've come to is, just what would it look like to take care of ourselves? Our revolution is in our everyday life, the ways when we break with the norm by building a new reality, based on kindness and support, mutual aid and solidarity. So you want to liberate yourself and forge a mutual aid society, but what form of organization is best suited to secure our liberation? Alone? What can you do alone? Maybe steal some stuff, hand out some food, light a fire, even assassinate someone. I'll admit, but I would still argue those things have a better chance of succeeding in groups. You have limited skills, you can only be in one place at a time. Unless you're Jason Bourne, you might be better off with other people whose strengths complement your own. So in a big group? What if you don't trust everyone in the group? You can do some stuff together, but you might not want them to know if you're breaking the law. And if a group doesn't have protocols for addressing and dealing with toxic members, it might get taken over by them. Sure, we could build a big party like Leninists do, but that party will get infiltrated by agents of the state, and if it starts getting things done, its members are easy to arrest because there's a list of them. What's more, those big parties and organizations tend to become oligarchies, as I talked about here, with an elite coming to be in charge while the rank and file of the party just pay dues and attend meetings. It's not that they have to, and I think you could have a successful organization with hundreds of people in it, as long as they have the right rules and processes and hold each other to them. There's a book in the description with a bunch of examples of such rules and processes, but there are also lots of examples online. Many leftists make the mistake of thinking you can achieve liberation by signing up to follow a hierarchy and take orders, because anything they do under a socialist banner helps the general revolutionary effort. It's easy to put your name down for a party rather than actually working towards something with comrades. It's easy to let the people at the top make all the decisions and assume it's useful because, you know, they're wiser than you. Likewise, it's easy to shoot for numbers, like more members and bigger budgets, rather than take action. Anarchists don't think like that. 
We want people to liberate themselves. That means the method of liberation should correspond to the goal of liberation. We want a structure organization for resistance and direct action. We don't want to replace the existing system, but create something new. Liberation isn't something that can be implemented by a committee. It's something that needs to be practiced. It needs to be in the structure of organization and in the minds of the free. If enough people have, to paraphrase Emma Goldman, the wisdom and courage to take back their freedom, the entire society will be free. There is a place for both individual action and mass action, but they're of rather limited value. What will be better? I don't usually say this, but I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. Something everyone can be a part of and contribute to, but not something too big to work. Let's talk about affinity groups. An affinity group is just a group of anywhere from 2 to 20 people who know and trust each other and work together to get stuff done. A tight-knit group is hard to spy on and impossible to infiltrate. The affinity group is adaptable and capable of rapid deployment. It can easily work with other groups. Affinity groups aren't necessarily illicit underground organizations. With a broad enough definition, it could just be a group of friends or neighbors. Unfortunately, even just building a community garden in an empty lot might be illegal. So if we want to do what we think matters, we might have to keep the association a secret. To understand the power of affinity groups, we need to understand mosquito power. Picture innumerable people swarming on an enemy, disarming it with a million little bites, then getting away or moving to the next target before they can be stopped. If a peaceful protest turns into a fight with the police, if you're all in one place and unarmored, you're at a major disadvantage. Swarm tactics make it easier to attack your target and harder for the police to catch you. Imagine just a quarter of the participants of the anti-war rallies were also in affinity groups that operated independently of each other. Imagine instead of putting all their efforts into one action, they could harass and hamper their enemies every day, making them harder to predict and prepare for. As mutual aid gets harder to deliver but more vital than ever, we can apply the logic of mosquito power to all kinds of social problems. Has feeding the homeless become illegal where you live? Instead of giving out food at the regular time and place and getting fined, you could swoop in, deliver food, and be off before the police know you've done it. In fact, just being homeless is illegal in cities all over the US. If you see the police messing with a homeless person, you can message your affinity group on Signal or whatever, and they can arrive to help. Affinity groups come together because of some shared perspective. They might agree they want to start a knitting circle or stop capitalists from owning their water supplies. They can do both. There are no limits. Some of them learn and study together, which is mapped out in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And at some point, they take what they've learned and act, which could mean knitting sweaters or a campaign of sabotage against a huge corporation. Whatever they think they should be doing. Diverse groups and movements are already creating a resurgence of illegal and confrontational tactics, such as kidnapping their bosses, threatening to bomb their workplaces, economic blockades, auto reductions, mass shoplifting or non-payment of bills, occupations, sabotage, and militant demonstrations as part of their daily struggles. In Europe, and notably through NATO and the convergence and coordination of security policies, armies and police are collaborating and preparing to move against social movements in the explicit expectation that things will intensify and more people will bring their rage to the streets. This context is going to challenge our strategic cleverness, our capacity not to fall into arrogant vanguardist messianic and identitarian dynamics, and our ability to keep and create connections from inside the social movements with all their complexities, diversity of tactics, and contradictory debates. Affinity groups set their own goals. We might think of the Black Bloc, anti-fascist action, or other agitator criminal terrorists as an affinity group, and they might be, or they might be more of a loose network, or they might never have met. But not everything an affinity group does is in the street or in one place. It doesn't matter if you can't go out. We need people on computers too. Have you seen sneakers yet? It's about an affinity group using the internet to communicate before it was cool. People can leverage their various strengths in specific ways according to a plan, like in Ocean's Eleven or Reservoir Dogs, or they can just wing it, like the Trailer Park Boys do. Get 
stuff. Uh, just let me call my supervisor, please. Actually, I'd love to, but we need that phone, so sorry. If they can, affinity groups work in networks. If they're aware of each other, they can coordinate activity anywhere in the world. We should have innumerable, autonomous, untraceable affinity groups. They should swarm like mosquitoes to surprise and overwhelm the police or whatever other oppressive force. You know what? I think we already do. But you can never have too many. In wrapping this video up, I realize there are all kinds of related issues I haven't talked about. I haven't mentioned the risks, the chance of getting arrested, beaten, gassed, or worse by the police or the right wing. It's really important to take care of yourself and the people around you. None of us benefit if you get arrested or hurt. Plan, coordinate, and watch each other's backs. Read the links in the description and go to workshops to learn how other people have stayed safe. One last thing before I go, operational security. OPSEC means not talking about what you're doing and keeping everyone's identity a secret. It should be paramount, but it's a whole topic and I don't think I'm qualified to talk about it anyway. So again, links in the description. I'll see you next time. And don't forget to shut the fuck up.